pool uh, of the panel, uh, you're the one who seems to me most clearly uh, behind the idea of there being an absolute good. So how do you defend the idea of the absolute good, uh, of there being an absolute good, given that the suicide bomber and the pacifist have radically different accounts? Is just one of them wrong? Uh, Oh, yes, <laughs> and it can be. So now, look, how do you decide? Uh, well, so there is there is the question of whether there is a, a truth maker, as it were, for a dispute. Uh, though you have to you have to be careful and interpret the dispute first. So, uh, and and let me just say one very quick thing here, because uh, the the notion of an absolute good, um, it I was interpreting it to mean objective, meaning independent of the attitudes of the disputants. There is another thing that's at work, which is this idea of some ultimate good. Is that there are many, many goods, and we can all agree they're objectively good, but is there some ultimate good? These are two different issues here, and they're, they're somehow rolled into, rolled into that word. So uh, right now, for me, what matters, rather than the idea of some you know, thing ob w on which you cannot improve, uh, is just the issue of the objectivity of the value claims that are made. So can you, can you explain that a little bit further? So this idea of the ultimate good being different from the objectively good. I mean, what do you... D well, you if, see if something is objectively good, doesn't that mean that it is, in a sense, ultimately good? It's that, that's just well, how that's it is. Th th all I was saying is that... So you think, uh, you know, you can have a question about whether in a dispute um, one position is more correct than the other one, or, or correct versus with, with the other one being false. And therefore, you can think that some, some acts are better than others without necessarily thinking that there is some terminus to which we all have to aim. What we have to aim, you know, suppose that the, uh, the, the kind of morality we have is a morality of duty, okay, rather than uh, a utilitarian one in which there is, as it were, some maximum happiness that we could strive for. Then in that kind of setting, what you have to do is, as it were, do what, what your duty calls on you to do. Uh, but without a sense that there is some ordering of states of the world in which one of them is ultimately best. Are you comfortable with that, Michael? Well, apart from disagreeing with it, yes, I guess I am. Um, <laughs> as I say, uh, um, I, perhaps it's because you live in New York City and I live in Tallahassee, Florida, but I... I I, I, keep, I don't want to be a bore about this, but I just worry about absolute goods or moral realism or, or, of some sense like that because I see again and again with people that I'm dealing with, not, not students and, and <coughs> not so much faculty, but certainly outside, people who are absolutely convinced that they know the truth, that this is the truth and if... It, it, it's not up for debate. I mean, for instance, you and I might differ, for instance, about which, what the best kind of coat is to wear in this sort of weather. No, I've got a barber coat, you've got, you know, something else. And I could well see that we, you know, we might debate it, we might not convince each other, but we wouldn't go away thinking, well, I've moron that guy is because he just doesn't see the absolute truth that barber coats are better than anything and there's a it gets a kind of rigidity about it and that I think is what really worries me about the absolute truth thing is you might say well of course it doesn't mean to say that absolute truth isn't true but it makes me very uncomfortable about accepting it and experience has taught me in my 78 years that if I'm uncomfortable about accepting something, it's probably because there's a moral nag behind it somewhere, and I'm trying to paper over <laughs> something. And that, uh, so as I say, that's more or less where I stand. Obviously, uh, and I think this is a good thing, I'm inquiring rather than telling you. <laughs> and I wa I, for me, it's a dialogue usually with myself, but I'm happy to make it with others too. <laughs> so Paul, uh, absolute good is dangerous here. Yes, now let me, re this is a very, very good uh, little bit of reasoning to have out on the table because I think it moves many people and if it moves somebody as distinguished as Michael Roos, it's very, very important to see <laughs> whether there is anything to it. And the answer is there is nothing to it, <laughs> to be provocative. Listen, take a case where there is simply no doubt that there are objective 
absolute truth. Let's just use objective, because absolute is somewhat misleading. Science, okay, let's take the physical world. Now, if what you say is true, that if somebody believes that something is objectively true, that that's a morally problematic thing, because you're going to ram it down somebody else's throat who disagrees with you, then we may as well give up objectivity in science as well, the idea that there is a way the physical world is. Uh, take the case that's ho close to your heart, evolution. What shall we say? Look, there are people who think that evolution is objectively true. But what a dangerous thing to think, because we're going to ram it down the throat of the creationist. Well, look, first of all, the belief that there is a fact of the matter about some area is completely independent of what you go on to do with those beliefs. How you treat those beliefs, how you treat people who disagree with you, what level of tolerance you show, what level of respect, what level of you know, accommodating the, the instincts that they're bringing to the table are totally different things. And we see this all the time in the case of science, where no one will dispute that there is a fact of the matter about what we're talking about. So this is a standard canard, okay? I mean, take, and, and to see this very, very clearly, that absolutism or objectivism about morality is not the issue. Think of what would happen if we're all relativists, okay? Let's just say, th would, that be a better, would that be a better, normatively better world for all of us? I mean, suppose that the North had taken the view about the South. Well, look, who are we to say that slavery is wrong, right? Uh, it's good for them, we don't want that, fine, we'll just kind of have a nice little separation and we'll let slavery continue. Nobody thinks that was a good thing. Sometimes having a conviction and acting on it brings about m great moral progress. Lifting people out of poverty, great moral progress. The vote in Ireland, let's suppose, great moral progress. But there being a fact of the matter, and you're being convinced of it, and how you then go on to treat other people are two separate things. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.